heading back in from the birth canal of cool inside the Norman store here on the grounds of the TVC. I'm sitting with Willem van der Skyt. I said that correctly for the second time? Um, just about, yeah. Two, two in a row. Yeah. So fantastic presentation. Uh, oftentimes people are wondering about those sorts of processes and I think you've covered them expertly. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. I want to thank you for being here. Thanks so much, I appreciate sure. it. Yeah. Cool. Don't, don't start a riot as they say. Uh, yeah. So. Most people probably don't realize this, but you're originally from South Africa. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, I grew up there and moved to the United States when I was around 12 years old. Okay. Um, lost the accent, unfortunately. That would have been nice. I'm trying to work to. on it, right? Like, yeah. I got my Australian accent going, yeah. right? Mate, I'm not going to lie. You want to watch when you're surfing? That's not bad. You want to keep your board between yourself and a shark? That's not bad at all. So that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. And then in South Africa, you say South Africa. Yeah, I'm working on this. That's true. I can hear. Yeah, right. South Africa. Anyway, so that, yeah. describe your experience. We were just talking off camera before they got us back in here in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Africa, growing up in Africa, and what that was like for you and what sort of visual representations and visualizations that's sort of fostered in you as an adult and as a young designer. Sure, yeah, I, I definitely think that um, growing up in South Africa had an influence on me as a, as a character artist particularly. Um, one of the things that really inspired me growing up there was the diversity of wildlife. Um, as a kid, I was always fascinated by uh, the big five, you know, elephants and buffalo and um, lions. And you mean ready. water buffalo, of course. Yeah, right. yes, that's right. Uh, Just different. Not American buffalo. Not an American buffalo. Uh, right. Whole different thing. Um, He's hunted. But, a whole other thing. Yeah. So uh, the wildlife there was always extremely inspirational for me. Um, and there's a part of living there where you feel a little bit more connected to nature. Mm -hmm. So um, it, between, between animals, like the mammals, and also, um, you know, as a kid, I used to collect bugs, like spiders. I had a bunch of spiders, which my mom hated, but. I'm um, sure you had some spiders that are just monstrous in size, <laughs> right? For those arachnophobia, uh, yeah, arachnophobia think, people at yeah. home. Yeah, there's some, there's some scary ones. They don't get as bad as the ones maybe in Australia, but still, there's some really interesting ones. And a lot of that reference, I think, sort of stuck with me for a very long time. I used to pay very close attention to all the little details, yeah. And so that's stuff that I reference back to all the time. It sort of gave me the foundation of, you know, uh, being really interested in nature was a big part of it, too. So I, I sort of mentioned before that my, my, uh, my father's a scientist, and so right. growing up, that was, you know, it was an emphasis. Like, curiosity for the natural world was something that was always, um, you know, sort of encouraged when I was growing up. So uh, I would often get you know, down on my knees and kind of flip rocks over and see what I could find. And I think a lot of that stuff really stuck with me when I started doing uh, character art. So you have a, it's safe to say you have a natural, naturally sort of inquisitive mind derived from this, you know, A, your father's mm -hmm. sort of scientific background. Yeah. And essentially your, your tacit relationship with the, the, uh, the creatures, mm -hmm. literally the, the real life creatures yeah. of the South African ethnos. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think uh, it's important it's actually an important trait for an artist in general to have that kind of curiosity. You're always trying to learn something new. You're trying to develop your skill. And to do that, you have to pull in a lot of information right. and process that and then express it through your art. So um, curiosity is always something that's, that's critical for that process. Do you find that this digital age that we're, that we're involved in now, I mean, we're talking about Africa probably some 20 years ago. I would safe to say that you probably moved from there about 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, we're almost contemporaries. Would you say that this particular age now where you can go on, on online and sort of search for reference of images, do you think that there's something to be lost uh, in that regard? Because you were actually engaging with these things physically and you have yeah. a physical sort of uh, a memory inside of you, a tacit memory where you say, oh, I know what that feels like. Yeah. And maybe someone else may not have that on a design team. So that... Um, that's a fund of knowledge. I think, is, I think that's, that's something that's critical. Now, I would say that the information age is incredible for just the volume of information that we have access to now. The, t the amount of reference is incredible. Um, but we haven't gotten to the point yet where we have all of our senses engaged. Right. We have visuals all the time. But there's also another thing that when you look online, you typically get the same view of the thing that you're looking for. You'll yeah. typically get a lot of pictures of an elephant from a different specific camera angle doing a specific thing. That's right. You have to dig much deeper to get to the details that you wouldn't notice um, unless you were there. And you don't get the emotion either. That's another point. You know, we're, we're getting more of that now, but it's right. still sort of in its infancy. I think, speaking of things in, in their infancy, with 3D printing coming online, I think it's really exciting because we're getting to the point where we can, we can actually include touch into that category. Go beyond the screen and have it back exactly. and forth sort of ta tangent and that, or tacit relationship. Exactly. And that to me as a, um, because 
learning through touch, I think, is, is really important as mm -hmm. a, a 3D artist. So do I, yeah, I believe it, that as well. It really helps you to formulate the form, the things, the shape. You know? The imagination. So I, I would go yeah. along with you on that and say that yeah. do you feel that there is that kind of that transference of knowledge, that physical knowledge? Like, I know what, what your pants feel like because mm -hmm. I have a pair of pants like that. And yeah. You say, oh, I know what that should visually be represented Absolutely. as on screen. I think, do you think that that's maybe something that the generation of kids today who are coming up just engaging with things on the computer are maybe lacking in some regards? Um, I think learning comes from many different angles, yes. I think uh, you should spend your time learning not just about what's online, but also what's in the world around you. And so in go nature, park, yeah, yeah go, go into nature. You can learn so much from that. And there's another benefit there in that um, it's not as derivative. There's a lot of, if you only reference art for mm -hmm. the art that you make, there's a lot of influences that you cannot pull in. Um, or, or I should say the influences that you're pulling in are something that someone else has made And already. they're linear as well. Yeah. They're coming from an origin point, and there's this sort of, this point A is the beginning, like yeah. you've got, uh, let's say, Monet. And then you go forward and you say, well, that's a, you can see the progression of right. how that visual representation of something has occurred right. instead of sort of going into the space, yeah. which is sort of a natural world and very Absolutely. erratic in some ways. Very organized, but very erratic. Yeah, and th there's value in that, but I think there's so much more that you can pull from. Uh, you can dig so much deeper if you, if you look into nature. You know, find, like, reach in deeper and find other in influences that maybe someone has not used as much. You know, so It's a fascinating way to look at design. I've been watching this spider for the last uh, few days in front of my house, and the mm -hmm. other day I caught him, yeah. uh, grab a fly, and I said, this is a very large spider. I don't yeah. know what kind it is, but I photographed this. I'll show you after off camera. Yeah, cool. It's, it looks like a macro, but it's, uh, it's indicative of this kind of mindset. Yeah. Taking this further, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you were saying a few things up there. You have a very, you're a very young man, but you had a very mature and very pragmatic approach to the way that you, appro you know, the way that you're going about making these particular creatures and characters for the game uh, mm -hmm. with Riot. And I wanted to ask you, does that, do you think that has something to do with your background at SCAD? As a, I think it's a, you're in product design. Is that, yeah, product design? Uh, yeah. So I think the benefit of the program that I had at SCAD was that it was a, uh, it was a more diverse. Um, you know, set of skills that we were learning there. It was mm. not focused purely on 3D. It was interactive design in general. So right. it got into aspects of game design, got into aspects of animation, even some programming. So I, from that, I got a really solid foundation to build on top of. Um, I wasn't able to leverage many of those skills until much later in my career. Right. But once I got to that point, I felt like, um, in a lot of ways, I was more multifaceted and right. be able to. Uh, I was able to contribute to the team. Um, much better. Well, you had, the, you had the tools that were there with you, and you were able to use them when you needed them, I suppose. Exactly. Because I mean, hearing you talk yeah. about it, I feel like, wow, this guy's got a very compartmentalized way that he's approaching this design process, and I think that you have, you know, you've had mm -hmm. years of experience now working in games. Yeah. Uh, this isn't your first rodeo. Yeah. Fair yeah. to say. Uh, yeah. You know, you're causing a riot, which is fine. Yeah. But I think that that's, uh, that's something to be celebrated, especially as such a, as such a young designer. Yeah, I appreciate that. Do you, yeah. Do you feel like that's something that is running through the entire team, or is it that you're I think it's something that we try to foster, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we, um, we really want people to embrace being game designers, not just being a, a specific type of artist. Right? We want them to really embrace the fact that they are developing a product that is the whole game. Right? And they're contributing a piece to it, but they're also responsible for the development of the game as a whole. Um, if you see yourself that way, collaboration comes much more naturally. Right. And, uh, the team feel, feels much more invested in one another's growth as well. So there's a lot of positive things that come from that. But you, you also mentioned that the teams are in some ways uh, divided up into smaller pods and pods, smaller groups, yeah. smaller groups rather, but there is a tremendous interplay between those smaller groups that become a macro group, yeah. which makes up the Riot family. There, Describe there definitely that and how is. That, how, how do you go from being in a micro situation to then thinking in the macro as, the, as a team which is concerned with the overall good of this very strong brand at this point. I mean, a, a worldly recognized brand. Right. So the way that that sort of breaks down is that um, the way that teams are constructed is, is around the product that they're developing. On Champion Team, we have three pods that are focused on developing champions, each of those. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they're responsible for the whole creation of that single champion. That, when you pull back a little bit, you, you have the Champion Team as a whole. And we have a set of values that we adhere to that relate specifically to developing champions. But then, you can step back even further and look at League of Legends as, as a larger um, product group. We also have values that we align to. Um, and within that larger group, we share all the time. We share our progress, how much progress we've made on something. We solicit feedback from people that are on 
on other groups. An artist from, say, a team that develops skins or develops the interface, um, they are welcome to walk over at any point, ask questions, give us feedback, have discussions about us, uh, about the champ that we're developing, and you know, both give us criticisms and also try to understand you know, the direction that we're trying to go with the chance. So you still have a very collaborative environment where yeah. you're going back and forth. Everyone is very welcome to come and say, hey, I don't want yeah. to talk to you a second. Well, yeah, we, we also have a, uh, a forum, internal forum, that where we share our work cool. continuously so people can always access There's that. There's a new educational uh, wing that's been born, I, I understand. I've been told this yeah. from the inside. Right, uh, yeah. I had some opportunities to speak with some people. Um, of course, shout out to them in a moment. But for now, what can you tell us about this internal learning experience, that if you can talk about it at all? Sure. If I've made an error, I'm sorry. No, no, it's it's totally fine. Um, so Tad, who was who was up there presenting with me, is he's the, taken off. He didn't, yeah, he, he took he's off. He's not under the bright white lights. He, he left you here by yourself with the yeah. sinister man himself. Uh, he had important things to do. He's got. He's yeah. a busy guy. <laughs> so he's actually the dean of that education program. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I wish we'd spoken more. And he's uh, he's working on on um, setting that up for us now. Um, it's it's sort of in its infancy at the moment. And we're developing it. Is he still here? Uh, I think I think he took off. All right. Well, don't. Uh, yeah. Carry on. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, it's all right. I, I'll give you a little bit of uh, of what I know at least about it. Um, what he's doing is um, he's pulling in a lot of the um, the internal talent that we have mm -hmm. and getting them trained up so that they can teach classes. Because we we have our our team is is truly like world class. There's some really incredible people there. Absolutely. I I'm humbled every day working there. It's is incredible. So. Um, we want to leverage those guys to be able to share their knowledge throughout the studio. When you say classes, let's clarify this because a lot of people don't have this interior knowledge like we do. What do yeah. we mean by this when you talk about teaching so classes? When we, uh, when we talk about that, we generally um, we try to get people that we feel has a very strong grasp of their specific uh, craft. Okay. So it could be an illustrator, um, it could be a 3D artist, um, but really almost anyone, even if they're a, a junior level artist, probably has something valuable that they can share with the team. Okay. So what we do is we have something set up called the, the discipline communities. So for each specialization, say you're, you're a character artist or, a, um, or an animator, there's a discipline community um, of people that have that same, um, that same craft expertise. And within that community, they set up classes, oh, wow. workshops, like and things micro like that. micro guilds. Exactly, yeah. So what a fascinating notion. I mean, that's, that's yeah. really something special. I, 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 yeah. Wow. And we really encourage everyone to contribute both by teaching and by attending, and it's reinforcing the culture of that discipline, but also you know the knowledge share that happens. People really level up because of it. That's so. fantastic. So speaking of the culture, you have your own personal culture outside of work, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you do play the game from time to time. Yeah. Um, other than that, what are you doing with your own personal work, and how, where does that derive inspiration from? Um, a lot of any of Africa still left in there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think so. We talked a little bit about the animals before, but uh, the African art is also something that's, that's always inspired me, um, especially because it focuses a lot on design and shape, you know, and, and stark contrast between colors. It's very powerful design, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of thing that tends to come across very well in character design, I feel. And the uh, characters are, are so rich. I mean, we, yeah. we hadn't mentioned this on camera, but I yeah. mentioned to you that I'd studied African history in university, yep. and imagining Zanzibar in my mind uh, was always something of a real trip for me because mm -hmm. I thought, Wow, the description of some of these things are science fiction worthy. You know, it's like yeah. happening, especially in 19th century Zanzibar. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can I can attest to this. This African sort of uh, behind the veil of the dark continent. You yeah. Know? You got interesting looking people, yeah. interesting animals, interesting creatures. I mean, it's just a wealth of. Yeah. Sort of, it's a f an encyclopedia of design. Yeah. Potentially waiting to be expo ex exposed. There's a very deep mythology to to Africa, and I think it's a mythology that that. Um, the Western world is not exposed to very right. often, um, and it, you know some of those stories that I grew up with uh, are things that still sort of stay with me. In right. fact, my um, so at, at Riot we have our our summoner names we call it is the name that we use in the in the video game, and we also use that on the forums when we communicate with um, with players. Uh, so mine on the back of my shirt it's um, it's Riot Tokolosi. Tokolosi is actually a it's a small um, it's almost like a little homunculus created by the Isangomas, which are the, the Zulu witch doctors. Yeah, there you go. And so this is something <laughs> that, I, that I heard about when I was a little kid. Right. You know? And I grew up listening Very to stories about Very powerful tribe of people, this. right? I mean, yeah. these are like the ultimate warriors of yeah. Africa, the Zulu tribes. And that, that type of mythology, is, it's really interesting and fascinating. And you know, we, in the West, we often derive 
a lot of our inspiration from um, from uh, European, you know. Yeah, Eurocentric constructs, of right. like you know Billy the Kid and right, yeah, the curled mustache and the Western warrior mm -hmm. and sort of. And and that stuff is you know there's a lot to be drawn from that, of but uh, but man, there's so much untapped stuff in the rest yeah. of the world. We want to pull some of that. Like for me personally, it's a goal to me too. pull some of that and really yeah. disseminate it to the world. Some of that stuff's some a real that. trip. I mean, I imagine yeah. what an army of eunuchs must have looked like. You know, a yeah. quarter million eunuchs. That's really yeah. something yeah. <laughs> precarious yeah. in the least. Pretty intense. Yeah. It's pretty intense. I mean, yeah. yeah, intense is a good way to put it. Yeah. And as well as some of the ships and things that are being described, they're right out of like a George Lucas film. Right. You say, wait a minute, this is like Star Wars without any, you know, without any sort of t yeah. computer technology. And that's sort of what I mean. You know, there's so much untapped, you know, stuff out there stuff. that people just <laughs> haven't really, uh, haven't really caught on to yet. So I think, I think, when you're creating art, like dig deeper, find out what else is out there, do some research, like really, like find that information. It's that curious mind thing that you were mentioning before, you know. Yeah, the, and even the way you discuss it again, you're coming back to that scientific background, so yeah. it's obvious that your father's had an impact on you. Yeah, uh, clearly, yeah. I mean, absolutely. That, that goes without saying. Yeah, uh, it would be uh, erroneous to, to say anything different. I wanted to ask you this very important question: Describe the challenges and the realities of working on characters with such a huge public following. You know that what you're doing, I ask this of a lot of people, but this is a very, very particular case. You, you are working on something that is under the eye of millions of people around the globe. There's even a huge sort of once a year sort of Champions uh, League type of event that happens live in the yeah. Staples Center in some cases. This is a big deal. What you're doing is not something that's just going to be seen and gone. This is happening live and on the cuff. How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, most of the time, I try not to think about it. Right, I'm sorry. To put it on the side, right? Leave it to me <laughs> no, to put you on the spot yeah, with the no, feather no. boa and the sunglasses. It's uh, <laughs> getting hot in here, right? It's really daunting. Uh, it is a really daunting concept, of course. I feel like we are really accountable mm -hmm. um, to, to make things that really resonate with the player base. And I think that's something that we, that we kind of continuously come back to at Riot is that whenever we sort of feel like, you know, we're kind of getting off track or we don't know what to do, we always try to remember, okay, what, what is... What are the players looking for? Right. What, what really resonates with our player base? Um, we spend a lot of time trying to understand, you know, like the the memes around the game. Like that's that's why, as I mentioned during the talk, yeah. we are sp we are all gamers. At Riot, we are passionate about the game that we make. Uh, we are gamers, just like everyone else that plays the game. Um, so we understand the memes. We're we're really looped into that, and I think that's why that's why it makes it easier for us to to have a sense of what will resonate. And we want to continue to sort of, it's a relationship of trust, right? The, the players trust us to build things that they, that they really want to see. I think this is a running theme, actually. Now that we're coming to terms with this this morning, we've seen and we've heard this from these very tight communities, internal communities that these mm -hmm. uh, industry-leading companies who happen to be using ZBrush, but the real sort of fabric of all of this is that there is a mutual trust between, A, the people who are making and designing these things in this creative space, mm -hmm. which is a very beautiful, uh, and I've just come to terms with this, uh, most recently, again, is that mm -hmm. there's this beautiful sort of birthing process that is occurring. Uh, Mother Earth is sort of giving us the energy and the cosmos is fueling this fire inside of us all that mm -hmm. is coming together to help us create. But then at the same time, there is this mutual trust between, you know, groups of smaller groups of people and bigger groups of people, mm -hmm. between the people making the stuff and the people receiving the stuff. So there's this wonderful interplay. Yeah. Do you feel like you're a part of this magic all, every day of your life? Yeah. I'm, it must a be the case. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think we all do on the team and I think we all take that very seriously. It's a responsibility that um, that I think all of us have, um, and as you say, it is very visible. Um, but that is sort of why we take it as seriously as we do. Um, I think it's very unusual as well at Riot, in that they trust every single person on the team to be a representative for their product for for Riot as a whole. Anyone that works at the company can get uh, can get access to. Uh, to the forums and post there without having to have anything filtered through anyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a little bit of training just to kind of help you to understand, you know, um, how to, how to, you know, have like considerations for communication, how to do it properly. But there is a trust that everyone is going to be responsible in the way that they communicate and, and engage with the player base. And because of that implied trust, I think uh, we give back in kind, you know. I think we, we take that responsibility very seriously. And the strength of the brand that is born from the interior and kind of proliferates out into the ether of the people playing and it it's, speaks volumes that, the, you know, yeah. around the world there are millions of players and, yeah. you know, there's this wonderful sort of collection of people. Yeah, and I think that that 
trust has been built up for a very long time. And Absolutely. Something well, that we value a lot. It's a very strong community-based sort of environment as well. Yeah. We've seen that with the Zebra Central Forum over the mm -hmm. course of several years and yeah. over a decade of community sharing and, and sort of people pulling each other up and just, again, tapping into that creative spirit, which right. is running deep in us all. I mean, I think this is another example of that. And I, I'm happy to be able to sit and talk about it with people at yeah. nauseum. Let's go a little bit deeper here. Uh, I wanted to talk about, you know, did you always want to do this? I mean, let's think about this. You've come from Africa mm -hmm. in the 1990s during apartheid, yep. escaping at a time when it was very precarious. Mm -hmm come to America, you know, do this product design business. Uh, how did you transgress into, into video games for the people at home? And did you always feel that way? So I grew up playing video games a lot when I was, when I was a kid in South Africa. Um, what was your favorite game? Uh, oh, man. I can't ask that. <laughs> I have a big time for fighters. I have a, yeah, yeah, there was a big time for fighters in that period. If you're going to call the 90s, I mean. So for me, um, what we had access to in South Africa were typically our, the penny arcade games, right and we had um, we had anything that could be pirated because you couldn't actually buy a game there. Oh, geez. But it was it, you know that was sort of the reality because at the time there was sanctions against South Africa, of so course, yeah. a lot of the imports just weren't happening. So you would get it. That's the only way you could get it. Um, I played uh, Warcraft, the original one, back Probably. in the day, and that was that was a big deal for me. Got the cool points for that one. Yeah, uh, that was. That was pretty formative for me. Um, the original XCOM was a huge, okay. uh, like, oh, and I, I would say another big one for me was Golden Axe. <laughs> yeah, right. The original Golden Axe that took 20 minutes to load. You'd, like, select your character, yeah. and then you go outside and play for 20 minutes and come wait. back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on a 486 back in the day, yeah, so. That was a great one. Yeah, that was awesome. I like that game, actually. I know you say that. I, I think I may have that somewhere at home. Somewhere There's little away. parrot dinosaur things you could ride. Those things were <laughs> yeah, amazing. Right. The around, you know? Yeah, what a classic. Um, basically, I mean, I think that f we've come so far. Now you, you were talking earlier about the detail and sort of making maps and things for these characters that you're only seeing from three quarters uh, the top view. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like, you know, gosh darn it, I'd like to see this a little more? And does that ever creep into your mind? Because I was thinking that while yeah. you were showing, me, I was like, oh man, there's so many good things happening with that <laughs> character. It's like, yeah. so you know, it's the medium that we work in, um, right. and. Uh, the beauty of the beauty of being able to be part of the character's development rather than just um, building the final model that goes in game, you know that of course is my passion as a character artist. But um, we also develop a lot of uh, materials around each character. Um, there's typically promotional um, materials around the release of the right. champion that we're involved in. Um, you know, we have discussions around it. Uh, sometimes the models that I build are used in those. Um, so there are other ways that I get to have my art. You mean you know, physical influence. product as well. I know this firsthand that there's some physical product that ends we, up going from yeah. screen to yeah. physical collectible. So we're, mentioned. yeah, we're actually developing um, more and more physical goods now, collectible right. figures. Right. Um, um, How are these being received by the community? So far, it seems like they're very well received. You know, we're, um, I think we're learning a lot of lessons because just like, Many things, um, Riot wants to own any product that we put out there. We want it to be high quality, so we want to um, we want to do it ourselves. But it's really a very different business sure. than uh, developing a non-physical product. So right. there's a lot of lessons that have to be learned. So we're going slowly, but I think we're we're making strides, and and it, it seems like it, it's it's being well received at this point. We've got a lot of encouraging feedback on it. So I think like it just speaks volumes to the strength of again the uh, the overall world that's been built you can mm -hmm. really plug and plug and play and I think that yeah. that's, that, that actually serves as a, let's talk about that from a narrative standpoint I think yeah. that having a such a such a vast world that is so driven by community is also uh, instrumental in facilitating great artwork because mm -hmm. at the same time that you're thinking about what you could be creating you're being informed by this interplay that's happening between Absolutely. the community and yourself and you think oh well everyone would like to see something like this yeah it just makes designing that much easier you know, that, that is actually, you're touching on something that's actually very, um, very true and something that we um, are con constantly sort of discussing internally as well. Um, when we build champions, one of our challenges is that there's, there's no interplay, the type of interplay that you're talking about. Um, when we redesign champions, which we do from time to time, we kind mm -hmm. of reboot them, um, the first thing that we do is to go online and try to understand what the community perception of that champion is, because a lot of times they will inform the true personality of the character. Absolutely. Where they were, 
if the character was somewhat two-dimensional in the past, they have often fleshed them out more and have a deeper understanding of who right. they are. And um, what's beautiful about that is we, we can borrow that and, and build that into the character and make it more explicit. You know, so they are, in a way, collaborating to that process, which exactly. I, I love that. I, I think, think a layer of interactive um, creativity that's occurring mm -hmm. between the audience and the, yeah. and the producers of the content, which right. is really something that fascinates me lately. I mean, yeah. I've been sort of seeing people doing different things with online comic books, et cetera. Yeah. This is just another facet of that, you know, right. in that regard. I mean, I think it's really special. Not only that, but I think, I think we really, we love um, the fan art and, uh, you know, all the, all the spin-offs that, that some of the players create. Uh, there's a lot of people that make um, their own versions of, of plushies of the characters and, you know, comic strips and no kidding, videos right? and all this stuff. And, and we love that. We love looking at that stuff, you know, just as much as, as any other player does, and I guess more in some cases because you know it's our, our baby, and it's a, you're sort of watching it go into the world and yeah. grow into something that's much larger than you ever could have conceived. Um, and it's not until it gets out into the community that I think it really takes on its true form. So we get it up to a certain point on the champion team, but it really comes to life when the community has a chance to interact with it. How they've embraced it and then they take it further. Yeah, and, and you've seen that I'm sure numerous times. Yeah, and, and they sort of inform what the, what the champion ends up being in the end. You Can know? you describe a particular case uh, as, as an example? Um, Just something one, one that sticks out most significantly yeah. where you thought, oh, we put this out and it's gone completely in a different direction well, maybe? You see that a lot with some of the older champions. Okay. Uh, some of them, they didn't have a whole lot of, uh, they didn't flesh out the, uh, the backstories as much. Or right. Maybe there were some like, you know, gaps there that people didn't quite understand. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a lot of cases where people will attach different behaviors uh, to some of the characters. Like, for example, Timo is one of the uh, most iconic characters in our game. He's a little, a little ferret creature that has a green hat, like a scout hat on. He shoots little darts, and he hides in the bushes. And he, you know, he's, very, yeah, he's like a very innocent-seeming yeah, right. character when you play <laughs> him. But the way that he comes across in game is terrible. He, he like, jumps out of bushes. Uh, you, you hit his toxic mushrooms, he shoots you with darts, and it's one of the most frustrating things to get, to get attacked by. So um, people have actually nicknamed him Satan. So they refer to <laughs> him as Satan in the context of League of Legends because he is a pretty evil character when you have to go up against him in many cases. And so what has evolved is that his personality is actually, um, the way that he's portrayed in a lot of fan art is as this maniacally friendly, because that's how he's presented, well, character that enough, has this right? really dark side. <laughs> but then the beauty is that we sort of spun off of that. Right. And then the latest skin we put out for him is a post-apocalypse skin, where he has taken on that persona. And he's grizzled and war-torn and, and battered. And he talks, like all of his dialogue talks about all of his lost friends. And yeah. I think that yeah, really God. resonated, that, that resonated so strong. <laughs> yeah. So you see that, that, that in that capacity, the community is informing design in the game, which I think is like mm -hmm. just a trip because it's, it's like the whole world is involved in creating this thing. Yeah, it's like a massive collaboration, really. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys are just facilitating the physical, yeah. the physical realm. Uh, speaking of which, yeah. I was going to touch base with you. I want to touch base with you on one last thing. The, let's talk about really quickly the recent discovery of a new human ancestor in Africa. How yeah. do you feel about it? I think is incredible. Anything that can further our knowledge of our origins, I think, is super exciting. Yeah. And um, you know, it serves creativity too. You know, you see kind of like where our roots are. Yeah, and it yeah. proves the, the 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 point that nothing is linear and everything is sort of percolating yeah. on top of one another. Yeah, it's constant iteration, just like an art. Right? They're giving me the speaking of percolating, they're percolating the finger behind the camera, the yeah. spinning finger wrap of it death. Up. Wrap it up. I want to say cool. uh, on behalf of myself and Willem here, also want to shout out to uh, Kenny Carvalho. We're looking at you, pal. <laughs> All the best to you and the rest of the Riot team. It was a pleasure hanging out with those guys on the beach. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of myself and the entire Pixelogic team. It was a pleasure. Let's take it back over to the rest of the team in the green screen hangar here at the Nolan School. Louis Tucci, on behalf of Willem, uh, we'll see you inside. Hello.